Our scripture reading this morning, as Paula indicated, should be one that is very familiar to each one of us. Taken from Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21, so I invite you to listen. Listen for the word of God to you. When Jesus heard what had happened, okay, what happened? Well, you have to wait till the sermon to find out what happened. What caused him to withdraw by boat privately to a solitary place? Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. As the evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and Looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Friend, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The headline reads, Jesus feeds 5,000 families. Grabs your attention, doesn't it? I mean, it gets everybody's attention. I think we all are very familiar with the story because that is something you just don't forget. I don't think you really have to be a Christian to know that story. But do you know the backstory? Do you know what happened prior to this time? Do you know what drove him to this solitary place? Do you remember why he went there? Matthew 14, 13 says, when Jesus heard what had happened, okay, what happened? Go back. Yeah, before that, let me mention he had taught large crowds of people, and he spoke to them in parables, all of these word pictures. And I don't know how you as educators in this congregation, and we have several, I don't know how you feel after you teach a class or two or three, but when I preach on Sunday morning, when I go home, all I want to do is sit down in my recliner, watch a football game, and take a nap. This drains me. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy doing this. It is a pleasure. It is work, but it is a pleasure to do this, but it absolutely wears me out. Well, okay, Jesus was fully human as well as fully divine, so I think after teaching all of those people, he got just a little bit tired. Maybe that's the reason he wanted to go to a solitary place. Well, something else happened after he taught the crowds. <clears throat> do you remember what that was? He went to his hometown. Do you know what he did in his hometown? He got up in the synagogue and he preached. How did his home congregation receive him? Yeah, thumbs down. They were offended by what he said. How would you feel, Carlton, Larry, if you went to your home church, you preached to them and they run you out of town? Yeah, I think that would be a big time downer. So, and I pray that, well, I hope y'all don't do that. I don't really ever want that to happen, so maybe that was the reason, you know, that would make me want to just kind of want to go be by myself in a solitary place, but that wasn't the worst. That's bad. The preaching was good. Being run out of town is bad. What happens next is worse. He finds out, which is what Kay said earlier, that his cousin was dead. But not just dead. His name is John. We call him the Baptist or the baptizer. He is killed. But not, I mean, he is beheaded. 
and his head brought in on a platter. And we've all, we haven't been to that place, but we've all had those moments when we've worked too long for too hard and we're just worn out and we just need a little peace and a little quiet. And many of us, we have been hurt by people that we love that for some reason, somehow, they have turned on us and we have all lost people we love. What do you need to do when those moments happen? The first thing you need to do is exactly what Jesus did. You need to find a solitary place. You need a time where you can just sit alone and pray to process what has just happened in your life. And as I said, Jesus was fully human and fully divine, and so he needed that time. Did he get that time. No. What happened? He encountered a crisis, which I think is about the worst thing that can happen to you when you're down, when you're depleted, when you've got this hand of grief and sorrow and pain and exhaustion just staring you in the face. There was this crowd that followed him. His faithful fans followed. He got on a boat, went across the lake or whatever, they got around on land. They heard that he was going. They got there before he did. He lands, and he does not do what I think I would have done. If I'm worn out, if I'm depressed, I'm going to turn around, get back in the boat, and go back in the other direction. <laughs> Fortunately, Jesus isn't me. Unfortunately, I'm not always like Jesus. He doesn't do that, which is just, that's a miracle for me right there. And I'm, I'm glad in Matthew 14, 14, what does it say when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd? What was his response? He had compassion on them and healed the sick. I've told you about my little granddaughter, Lucy, who was two and a half, and she didn't speak until she was a little over two years of age. And the doctors were worried about her. The parents really weren't. The grandparents kind of, we were a little bit. But boy, when she started talking, she just started talking. And she is just going to town now. She just talks and talks and talks. You kind of, I have to have an interpreter when I'm over there. But she is talking. And mom and dad knows exactly what she's saying. And she's very independent. She wants to do everything herself. Then sometimes she gets frustrated when she can't do it on her own. And, and Will was telling me, my son was telling me, and she'll look up at me and say, Help, please. Help, please. Would that break your heart or what? You know, help, please. So what are you going to do? Go, no, nah, I'm not going to help. Well, that's how Jesus felt when he saw the crowds. What were they saying? Help, please. My youngest daughter, who is in two and a half, she's 31. Two weeks ago, and you know about the call. What was she saying when she called? Help, please. Not in those words, but she was crying. And that's what she was asking. What parent is going to go, I'm going to get in the boat and turn around and go in another direction? No. And Jesus, why did he have compassion? He loved them. They were his people. They were his children. They were his grandchildren. And he loved them. And we almost missed the miracle of, to me, that's a miracle in itself, just having the love and the compassion when you're worn out, when you're exhausted, when you're in grief, to realize the needs of the other people around you. But he healed the sick. And we just kind of skip right over that one. Oh yeah, he, he's done that before, not a big deal. Let's get to the 5,000. Well, that's kind of a big deal, don't you think? And I think he still does it today. And in a lot of different ways as he looks at us, when we look up at him and we go, help peace we all do it, don't we? And I've done it a lot lately. Well, it was a remote place. That's what it says in 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy some food. How many times have you been in that place, that remote place? And it is the cry of a, of a 
of a spouse who is trying desperately to save their marriage and they don't think there's any way that they can turn the situation around so they are in a dark place. They are in a remote place. It's the cry of a small business owner when big chain stores come in and just take all the business away from them and they're wondering how in the world they're going to survive and they feel like they're out on an island all alone. They're in this remote place and it's the big chain stores who sees their businesses being drawn away by all of this online shopping and Amazon can get stuff to them quicker than you can get to the store. And so it is a remote place. It is a desolate place. It's a cry of someone who sees their child or children going off the rails and you want so much to have a magic wand and go, poof, it's okay. Everything is fine. But you know it's not okay. And everything is not fine. And you know there isn't anything you can do about it except to love them, except to be there for them. And knowing that they have to do this on their own with your support. We've all been in that remote place and we all keep looking up to heaven going, help please, help. So what does Jesus say to them? You know, it's an amazing thing <laughs> that he says to them. This is what he says to them. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Well, that's impossible. I mean, because, wait a minute, we only have here, we have nothing here but five loaves of bread and two fish. This is impossible. Do you realize God is always asking us to do the impossible? Things that we don't think we can do. He keeps asking us to love the unlovable. To love people we would much rather hate. He asks us to forgive that which has been done to us that is absolutely unforgivable. And we know intellectually that's a pathway to peace. And we don't know how in the world we can possibly do it. He tells us to hold on and to stand firm when that's the last thing we want to do. We want to let go and give up, give in, and just go, I quit. I just can't do this anymore. Keeps asking us to do the impossible. All we have here, we have nothing here but five loaves and Two fish. Why does our something always look like nothing to us? Five loaves and two fish. Well, that isn't much, but it isn't nothing either. I mean, it is something. And that's what God calls us to do, to take what little we have. Yeah, it doesn't seem like much, just a few little boxes. But you take a few little boxes from one little church and you share it with hundreds of churches over an entire denomination and more than one denomination sharing and all of a sudden you can feed people, you can help people and miracles are happening. So he asks us to take our something, whatever it is, even though it may not seem like much and we think in the face of so much need, how could it possibly matter? But he says, you just give me what little you have and just see. You just wait and see what I can do with it. So don't give up and don't give in and don't quit. Bring them here to me, he says. Why? Because he keeps doing the impossible. God does. Now can we, can we defeat the Goliath that stands in front of us? Can we make it through that fiery furnace on our own? No, I really don't think we can, but we're not asked to do it on our own, are we? When we have that cry of help, please, he says, just bring me. Just bring me what you have and I will do the impossible. And that is good news for frightened business owners that are thinking they're gonna lose everything they have. It is good news for a spouse who is trying desperately to save their marriage. It is good news for somebody who gets a horrible report from the doctor and they don't think anything good is coming out of it. Because we believe God can perform miracles. What does he do? And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. 
Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. Do you remember the time when Jesus was in a boat with the disciples and he was asleep and a storm came up and the disciples got frightened and they woke him up and he calmed the storm and said, Oh ye of little faith. Somebody made the comment, the key to life is not finding a lake that has no storms. The key is having Jesus in the boat with you. Are you going to have a life that has no conflict, no trouble, no turmoil? No. It is never going to happen. So the key is the same for us as it was for them. It's having Jesus in that boat, in that situation, in that life, in that turmoil, in that crisis with you. Believing. Believing what? Believing that he can do the impossible. Believing that miracles can take place. Do you remember Advent begins next Sunday and they're going to put up the decorations tomorrow for it. And the Christmas story is just filled with miracles. Do you remember an angel by the name of Gabriel saying to a virgin by the name of Mary, he appears to her and says, oh, by the way, you're going to have a baby. And her response is what? That's impossible. It can't happen because I'm a virgin. Virgins just don't give birth to babies. And what did Gabriel say to Mary? For nothing will be impossible with God. And so as we take whatever it is we're facing, and we don't know how we're going to make it through, we take it. What little we have, a little faith, what little effort, what little energy, what little resources we have, and we give it to him. Now the Christmas story is filled with miracles from beginning to end. Wise men who weren't even Jewish, who weren't even believers. They were Gentile, found the Messiah in a house. The angels sing to who? Or to whom? Who do they sing to? The religious leaders, to the Pharisees, to the scribes, to Herod. They sing to shepherds out in a field. And I think that is a miracle. Who were the first ones to find the Messiah? Shepherds out in the field. And a woman who is said couldn't have children, she was well past the age, her name was Elizabeth, was indeed pregnant and a virgin, did give birth to the Messiah. There is a old song that said, God, any rivers you think uncrossable? God, any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He does the things that others can't do. And our life is filled with contrast. It's not all even. And we all know there are mountains, there are valleys. In Ecclesiastes 3, remember Solomon saying there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And a little bit later, what does he say? Everything is beautiful in its time. That doesn't mean everything is beautiful because cancer isn't beautiful. Child abuse isn't beautiful. Addiction isn't beautiful. Losing somebody we love is not beautiful. But what it means is God in time can take that which is horrible and terrible and evil and rotten and bad and transform it into something that is positive and something that is good and something we can build on. Do you remember what Joseph said to his brothers who threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery when he met them years later? Do you remember it? You intended evil against me, but God meant it. For good. God used it so that thousands upon thousands would be saved. And he can do the same for us. To take that which is ugly and terrible and horrible. And create something positive out of it. Let me share a quote with you from theologian Martin E. Marty. Who wrote a book. And I've shared this with you before. And I'm doing this for me so y'all can take a nap. 
He wrote a book about the terminal illness and loss of his wife. He said, one of the resources we need is a wintry spirituality for times when the warmth and joy is taken away from us and a sunny disposition is not enough to bring them back. We need a way of holding on to God when it feels like God has let go of us. Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, many of the Psalms, which are laments or complaints, are wintry books. When God himself came to earth, he came in winter. Jesus was known as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. From the cross he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever made that cry from your cross? I have. But Jesus was not forsaken, and neither are we. God is with us even in winter. And we need somehow to be able to say, ride along with Mary. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. I'm going to end the sermon with a video. And I hope the video communicates what I'm trying to say about how to be thankful even in the midst of a mess, even in the midst of a desolate place, even if you're in the midst of a storm.